Another class of reactions are explosions. Explosions are self-accelerating reactions. Their rate increases as a function of time. And there are two general types of explosions. One is a thermal explosion. In thermal explosions, we associate those with highly exothermic reactions. The exothermicity generates heat in the system. The heat increases the temperature through Arrhenius behavior. Increasing temperature leads to increasing rates. And so if that heat isn't dissipated, then the temperature goes out of control. The reaction rates go out of control and an explosion ensues. The other type of explosion is a chain branching explosion. A chain branching explosion occurs if the number of radical intermediates increases with time, increases exponentially with time. To avoid a thermal explosion, we need to get rid of that heat. So if we have lots of surface area and lots of well-cooled surface area on our reaction vessel, we can get rid of that heat. Also, good mixing leads for even dissipation of heat and lessens the likelihood of an explosion. In a chain branching mechanism, we have to keep down the number of those reactive intermediates. We could, for instance, add uh, an inhibitor to the system, and that would make it less likely to explode. Let's explore the kinetics of chain branching explosions a bit more and chain branching uh, mechanisms in general. So let's look at what is an idealized three-step mechanism. The first step is the reaction of our reactants, A and B, through an initiation step. And that initiation step generates radicals. The radical species is R dot. R dot can also go through branching reactions with a rate constant Kb that produce more radicals, as well as a product. We can also have a termination step in which you get recombination of radical species. This termination step with Kt as a rate constant produces another product. P1 and P2 are non-reactive products. R dot is a radical species that can go on to produce through branching more radicals. And the efficiency of the production of other radicals is given by this factor phi. If two radicals were produced from every R dot, then phi would equal two. Let's generate, for our three-step mechanism here, let's generate a differential rate law for the concentration and how the concentration of R dot changes as a function of time. Again, we will add in all the terms that generate radicals, and we subtract off all the terms that consume radicals. We'll rearrange this form into this more simpler gamma plus K effective, times R dot concentration. Gamma is just the rate of the initiation step, where this effective rate constant, it's equal to the branching rate constant times phi minus one minus the termination rate constant. Let's integrate this equation to obtain an expression for the concentration of radicals as a function of time. Integration leads to this nice, simple, closed exponential form. And now we can examine two different limits. One limit is when branching dominates. When branching dominates, Kb is very large, large enough such that this product, Kb times phi minus 1, is much larger than Kt. On the other hand, if termination dominates, then Kt is much larger than the product of Kb and phi minus 1. When branching dominates, the expression for the concentration of radicals as a function of time looks like this, which leads to an exponential increase in the radical concentration and an explosive path is followed. If termination dominates, then a nice smooth saturation curve is found. The concentration of radicals does not go out of control and a steady homogeneous reaction is observed instead. <laughs> control of this termination versus branching 
is really important as to whether the system goes explosive or stays in the homogeneous reactive mode. Let's look at this in a little bit more detail for the very important system of H2 plus O2, hydrogen plus oxygen, to give us water. What we see is the following. At very low temperatures, you can increase the pressure and the system will remain in a homogeneous reaction mode. No explosion is observed. But at elevated temperature, we will go from a homogeneous mode and as we increase the temperature, boom, we hit this point here. That's the first explosion limit. And it's a transition from homogeneous reaction to explosive reaction. Increasing the pressure further, it stays explosive until we again hit a limit, the second explosion limit, where the system switches over again into homogeneous reactive behavior. Increasing the pressure further leads to a homogeneous reaction until we hit the third explosion limit, and above that, the system remains explosive. Why is the behavior so complicated? Not all chain reaction mechanisms are as complicated as the H2O2 system. Some of them only exhibit one or two explosion limits, but H2 plus O2 exhibits all three, first, second, and third explosion limits. Let's see why. What happens at low pressure is that the mean free path lambda is large. In fact, if it's large compared to the size of the vessel, then free radicals get all the way to the edges, they hit the walls, and those chain carriers will be quenched at the walls. No explosion occurs until we increase the pressure. Increasing the pressure will eventually hit that first explosion limit. What happens there is, that the reaction will proceed explosively because the radicals are surviving. The mean free path is going down as the pressure goes up. Therefore, at some point, the radicals won't be able to hit the walls. They won't quench. And instead, they lead to more branching, exponential increase of radicals. Boom, the system goes explosive. Increase the pressure yet more. The mean free path is increasing. And the extra thing that's happening in the H2 plus O2 system is we're going to hit a second explosive limit where the system is going to go back to homogeneous behavior because there are a lot of less reactive species that are being formed. They're radical species, but they're less reactive. And so they have a they can survive several collisions and they get out to the walls where they'll again be quenched. So the system reacts homogeneously. Increasing the pressure, we'll get to the third explosion limit. And beyond the third explosion limit, even those less reactive species, they undergo so many collisions before they get to the wall that they're going to lead to branching reactions and more explosive behavior. So the system remains in that explosive limit above the third explosion limit. For the H2 plus O2 system, we see that the system goes from homogeneous reactivity to explosive at the first explosion limit, then reverts to homogeneous reaction at the second explosion limit, increasing the pressure into the high pressure regime leads to, again, explosive reactions in this highly complex H2 plus O2 system.